Okay, so welcome back. Uh, we are now uh, starting with the second, the, the third chapter overall of Guyton, uh, which is microcirculation. Uh, I just want to tell you that this particular um, chapter has two important things, concepts, uh, which relate to your examination. It's not a very overwhelming uh, chapter. Please try to just sort of skim through it. Uh, don't go into the very detailed nitty gritties that Titan has discussed, uh, the research uh, uh, aspects of uh, measuring pressures, this, that, the other. Skip that bit. That's not really essential. Do read it by all means, but purely from an examination point of view, that usually is skipped over. Uh, what I'll be discussing is the important bits here. So very, very simply and very quickly, this is simple stuff. This is, a, it's not an intimidating chapter. It's one of those uh, relievers in between heavyweights. Uh, this is just you, to show you uh, the microcirculation. Starts with arteriole, then you see uh, meta-arterioles, and these swellings here, the black spots, are the precapillary sphincters. This effect, uh, if they're constricted, blood flow from the arteriole towards uh, uh, the artery, the capillaries uh, constricts. Uh, and if they're dilated, it expands, very, very simple. And then these, the arterial end of the capillaries then become the venous uh, capillaries. And you can see the arrows, the blood flow is going towards from arterial side to venous side, and then they become venules and then veins and, and so on and so forth. Nothing spectacular here. However, this is an in interesting slide uh, to, to show you how these pre-capillary sphincters and the caliber, the diameter of arterioles uh, is, is actually a big determinant of what happens in tissues uh, when there is a fluctuation in metabolic activity. So this basically flow chart is of increased tissue metabolic activity. So you have, uh, it has just, so exam for example, this is a muscle uh, which has just, you have just started to in, uh, exercise and there is an in increased metabolic activity. So the demand of oxygen uh, is there and the existing oxygen is low and the carbon dioxide that you're now producing in this muscle is more and other metabolites, which are waste products are more now. Okay, so what do you do with this situation? You need oxygen, you need carbon dioxide and other metab metabolites to be removed from, from these tissues. So you need something to change now. What, how does the microcirculation change? I'm not talking about what happens to the heart or the big arteries. We are now talking about the microcirculation. So you would expect the precapillary sphincters to relax because you want more blood flow now, okay? So the precapillary sphincters will relax and the arterioles will vasodilate. So both of the functions of the, of this, uh, uh, of the arterial end is to pump more blood towards the capillary to address your uh, decreased oxygen and increased carbon dioxide, okay? Relaxation of precapillary sphincters and arterial vasodilation. Both of them, now look at how they increase the capillary blood flow. Number of open capillaries increases delivery of oxygen removed carbon dioxide takes place these open capillaries basically increase the surface area decreases the dif uh, different uh, the distance that uh, diffusion across which needs to take place uh, and so eventually your original requirement is fulfilled increase oxygen and removal of excessive carbon dioxide this is where microcirculations architecture uh, is explained from the physiological point of view. Okay, uh, this slide, I this picture, I again took it, uh, took it out of Guyton, and this is important uh, in the sense that look at the basic structure of the end endothelial cell. This is the basement membrane, the, the red lines, and on top of this sits the endothelial cell. This is one endothelial cell, second one, and then you have the third one. Look at the cleft here, intercellular cleft. There are uh, it can become a channel, it can serve as a channel, and it's sitting nicely on the basement membrane. So in, a, in, a, in, an, in, an, in an average tissue, this is, this is how the structure is. But in certain organs, this capillary structure, this configuration changes. So for example, in the heart, you have tight junctions. 
in between endothelial cells okay uh, in the in the git in the liver let's say in the liver the the intercellular clefts i beg your pardon when i said heart i i meant to say heart that is basically the myocytes basically the brain so in the brain you cannot have a situation where all the stuff and any of the stuff can come from the blood and right dump it on the brain itself so you have very tight regulation called the blood brain barrier and where endothelial cells have closed very close approximation very tight junctions amongst them so the blood is is kept separate from the brain tissue via this configuration of tight junctions between endothelial cells say in the brain as opposed to brain this is one example of how endothelial cells are configured its opposite is liver in which uh, these endothelial cells are have very spacious uh, clefts for movement of of uh, of material between the blood and the liver and then somewhere in between is the git in the git the vessels are uh, 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 between the brain tight junctions and the liver broad broad uh, tracts between cells uh, the GIT is in between uh, to absorb all the nutrients uh, that you that you have and water and so on. So this is just a, a it gives you a, a variation of the microcirculation amongst different organs depending on the function of the organ. Right, this is a UQ. Basically, uh, Starling forces are. I don't know if you have uh, read it in your uh, uh, previous school years. But basically, Starling forces are are forces that um, act across the capillaries. Okay, so very very briefly here, you have four forces right here: capillary pressure. This is the hydrostatic pressure. You can call it capillary hydrostatic pressure. You have the interstitial fluid pressure. Capillary pressure is the pressure within the capillary, basically the blood pressure. Then you have the interstitial pressure, which is the pressure of whatever small amount of fluid is in there in, the, in this interstitium. It also has a pressure. Okay, I will I will comment on the arrows later on. Then you have the third force, which is the plasma colloid osmotic pressure. Plasma colloid osmotic pressure is exerted by the plasma proteins of the blood inside the blood vessel, and it has a specific, uh, very important function, rather. And then you have its corresponding interstitial colloid osmotic pressure. So whatever little amount of protein that do manage to seep out of the blood into the interstitium, they also have their own osmotic pressure inside the interstitium. So these are the four forces which are acting across a capillary. Now, uh, as you can see, the capillary pressure arrow is out towards the interstitium. So if you have a capillary, blood will try to exert its pressure on the wall and will try to say, come out of it. So capillary hydrostatic pressure is like this. Oops. It wants to come out, outward. It's an outward pressure. Interstitial fluid pressure is again a hydrostatic pressure. It will exert its pressure on the outside wall and it will try to push fluid from the interstitium back into the capillary it will all make sense in the following slide just stay with me okay so these are the two hydrostatic pressures coming to the osmotic pressure i can't uh, right now go into the uh, chemistry of colloids and how they they exert an osmotic pressure suffice to say here and assuming that you would remember remember it from your chemistry classes Colloids are osmotic in nature. They want to hold up onto their water. They are jealous about it. They, they don't want to let go of it. So plasma colloid pressure wants to hold the water inside uh, the blood vessel. It doesn't allow it to go out. So the arrow is inwards. It wants to keep the stuff in. Same is the case with the interstitial variety of the osmotic pressure. Whatever small proteins come out, they want to get fluid out. 
the fluid that is out already they want to keep it to themselves and they want they have an they have an effect on the water of the capillary inside the blood to come out so they are trying to pull fluid out so look at this the capillary hydrostatic pressure wants to push fluid out the interstitial fluid pressure uh, hydrostatic pressure wants to push fluid in plasma colloid osmotic pressure wants to keep fluid in while interstitial colloid osmotic pressure wants to get fluid out these are the four things four forces which you need to be okay with this equation is very simple if you have understood what's happening here we want to calculate the net filtration pressure all of this system basically is set in a way that some filtration uh, uh, happens uh, throughout the length of the capillary as we will we'll see mathematically in the following slides but this is the formula you just subtract the, the capillary hydrostatic pressure from the interstitial hydrostatic pressure from the colloid osmotic pressure and from the colloid uh, interstitial uh, osmotic pressure and all of this gives a value which we'll discuss and it will become more clear to you when you have the value uh, so this is net filtration pressure across a capillary and when you put in uh, kf why why have we put in kf this is the uh, filtration quotient is because well this is not the case in the in in the in the entire body is it it's not just one capillary there are several capillaries and where, uh, all capillary beds beds are not open all the time not all capillaries participate in circulation all the time some capillaries are dormant you don't need them these are imagine these are roads which don't need to be opened when the traffic is low they only get opened when the traffic is a lot eid rush or something like that okay shopping ka rush uh, so normally some of the capillaries participate in the regular mundane uh, action but what if you have more blood coming through then more capillaries will open and the caliber of capillaries can also dilate a bit this is accommodated in a quotient in a, in a constant called kf so when you multiply you take uh, take your net filtration pressure and you you take your uh, kf value ie the whole surface area and the pore uh, and the diameters you put it all in you get a very nice accurate picture of the whole filtration event which is happening across not just one capillary but an entire bed of capillaries okay this is this will mo make more sense this is right out of Dighton. so you see i need to go up so that you see all these uh, numbers so and every capillary has let's say an arterial end and a venous end let me go back this so this is the arterial end of the capillary simplified here as say this end and then you have a venous end simplified as this okay so just keep that in your imagination we will refer to it to as arterial end and venous end so forces tending to move fluid outward now you remember which are the forces the capillary pressure this one here okay uh, I will come to this in a bit the interstitial fluid colloid osmotic pressure this one here so this and this fluid uh, the uh, force will try to move fluid out of the capillary at the arterial end yes the values are for capillary pressure it's 30 and for the interstitial colloid osmotic pressure is 8 right now what is this negative interstitial free fluid pressure it's a nice long fancy name for this little pressure here they are saying that this is not actually a positive pressure now remember this is a capillary imagine there are cells here here so this is the interstitial space what else is there in the interstitial space lymphatics right lymphatics so lymphatics keep on draining fluid okay when they keep on dra draining fluid there is a negativity in this area by the way it's a very small area very very minuscule area between the capillary and its attendant tissues very small area potential space almost 
very little it's it's just wet okay there's no collection of fluid because when something abnormal happens and there's a collection of fluid we call it edema and edema is not normal so normally this pressure is actually negative because of continuous suction of extra fluid down the rabbit hole of lymphatics that's why this negative pressure also tends to suck fluid out if it were positive it would push it fluid back or push fluids inwards but because of lymphatics it is negative hence it joins capillary pressure and interstitial colloid osmotic pressure as the outward force hope this is understood it has a value of three so you add this up it becomes 41 and the lonely force that now remains is this one plasma colloid osmotic pressure its value is 28 this is the only force normally which tries to keep fluid inside the capillary okay remember we are just talking about the arterial end so you subtract this you get 13 mm hg this is the net outward force at the arterial end so basically it is saying that at a pressure of 13 millimeter mercury at the arterial end fluid will come out this is we're talking about a almost a uh, an experimental situation where we have taken one capillary only one capillary bed one arterial end very simple one venous end so the net filtration pressure out at the uh, 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 capillary end uh, arterial end is 13 yeah 13 okay 41 minus 28 13 now work out the venous end okay at, at the venous end you have the the same plasma colloid osmotic pressure 28 and the force is tending to move fluid outwards look compare them this one with here this one you see that the capillary pressure at the venous end is one third of what it is at the arterial end okay it's 30 here only 10 here the rest are really the same so this gives you a value of 21 minus 28 minus 21 gives you a value of 7 and this 7 is what it's total inward force so what happens is the pressure which pushes by by virtue of which the fluid gets pushed outwards at the arterial end is 13 and it goes back in at the venous end at a pressure of 7, 7 mmhg so you can imagine in the strict sense of a single capillary you have a net fluid uh, pressure one end is 13 other is 7 so you can imagine that fluid would some of the fluid would remain in the interstitium because stuff pushing it outward has a higher value than stuff pushing it back in so the net fluid will be sort of trapped inside the interstitium for now just imagine that it's taken away by lymphatics so you do not have accumulation of fluid here this calculation by the way is asked in an exam so try to remember it okay now all sorts of uh, uh, some 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 clinical scenarios do come to mind which we'll try to uh, cover in not try certainly cover it in tutorials uh, so do participate with open eyes and open eyes and open minds please this is this is important stuff the clinical aspect of this whole calculation okay now starling forces basically all these were starling forces but starling what starling did was this this slide is based on a as i mentioned a selective part of a capillary system what starling did is he averaged, averaged it out across the entire length of the vessel of the capillary bed and he averaged out uh, uh, these values body wise so all over the body he gave you a an overall picture of what may or what does happen uh, at the body level when, once again this is a a, a selective uh, uh, single capillary system okay while this starling forces and equilibrium is a, a, an averaged uh, 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 values of forces 
acting across the capillary. So you will notice that it doesn't say arterial or venous end. It just uh, takes this entire capillary system as a, a single tube. So at, of course, at arterial side, you have more pressures and venous side has less pressures. But what Starling equation does, or Starling, this whole uh, description does, is it averages both sides uh, under one heading. So you see the mean force is tending to move fluid outward is now 17.3, not 30, not 30, not 10, but somewhere in the middle, 17.3. This is his experiments. That's why we, we name it after him. So he has averaged it. 17.3 is the mean. Now you see the word mean, mean capillary pressure across a capillary bed. The negative interstitial fluid is the same. The interstitial colloid osmotic pressure is the same. So now the adjusted value is 28.3 of fluid coming out and the mean forces tending to move fluid inwards. It's the same, the plasma colloid osmotic pressure, it has the same value, 28. So really the thing that, that changed only is the hydrostatic pressure. So when you subtract 28.3 and 28, you get a net outward force of 0.3. Now, this is actually more realistic when we are talking about the entire human being uh, in vivo, okay? On the go, real life scenario, not experimental. So the net outward force across, let's say if this were the entire microcirculation of the body, just let's assume. So throughout this length, there's a net filtration pressure of 0.3 mmHg uh, at, at, at which the fluid is coming out of this capillary and that fluid then keeps the surfaces wet and, and nice and supple and also is taken out. Any, any variations are taken out through the lymphatics. Okay. So I hope this is clear. Uh, edema is, uh, is, is something that will be featured in the tutorial, but very briefly, it is again accumulation of interstitial fluid in the interstitium, abnormally, large amounts, not good, very bad. And it can be due to the, a problem in any of these four starling forces. Okay, I will leave it to that and the rest will be covered in the tutorial in detail. I will give you the slides, you can see them, you can pause them in the video, have a, have a chin wag about this, uh, filtration pressure, osmotic pressure, and then increased permeability across uh, the capillaries and problems with the lymph flow uh, themselves, okay? This is just a straightforward uh, cause and effect exercise uh, of stalling forces causing edema, all right? Uh, lymphatics, uh, very quickly. Uh, the lymphatics are of two types. Uh, initial lymphatics, which are near to the tissues, and then they coalesce and drain the collected lymph in the collected uh, and the collecting lymphatics, which then drain them into the veins and so on. The important point here is the normal flow, the 24 hour flow of lymph is about two to four liters. So it's no small, uh, again, it's uh, for the entire body. It's no joke. It's a significant value considering the overall uh, amount of fluids moving around. Two to four liters is significant. If you block this, all sorts of problems can take place. One, number two is look at this statistic. It's very important. So the small amount, remember the small amount of protein that did filter out, it's actually about 25 to 50% of the total circulating plasma protein. So 25 to even 50% sometimes can filter out under, under pressure from the capillary into the interstitium only to be returned back uh, to the circulation via the lymphatics. It's a great job that they do every day. Uh, you would understand this uh, when you uh, study the importance of colloid osmotic pressure in the plasma. Uh, let me ask you a question. You can, you can think about it. What if these lymphatics don't return these, this, this, these plasma, these, these filtered plasma proteins back to the circulation? 
what will happen is you will have a decrease in plasma uh, proteins, decrease in plasma colloid osmotic pressure. Okay, this is one aspect. If lymphatics are fine, let me complicate the situation by failing the liver of the person. The liver fails, plasma proteins are made in the liver. If you fail it, they will be produced less. Again, it will have the same effect on plasma colloid osmotic pressure. It will go down. What do you think will happen in a person who has a slumping, a decreasing plasma colloid osmotic pressure? If you have understood the whole Starling forces interaction, you will come up with the answer very quickly. I'm not going to give it to you. You need to look it up and understand and make a concept out of it. Remember, when you apply knowledge in a testing scenario, it cements your concepts. Also, some long chain fatty acids and cholesterol also gets out uh, in the interstitium, especially in the intestine, where absorption takes place and lymphatics play a very key role in returning it to the vasculature.